Example 9.3.4, multiple IRRs, or multiple internal rates of return. Okay, the setup for this one says, a military commander who was involved in several famous incidents in the global war on terror has just retired. A publishing company has offered to pay him $600,000 today to spend the next three years writing a book about his experiences. They expect to publish the book four years from today and pay the author an additional $1.1 million at that time. Accepting this opportunity means that the author will give up lucrative speaking opportunities over the next three years while he works on the book. He expects that he could make $550,000 per year giving speeches over the next three years if he does not accept the publishing opportunity. How many potential IRRs does this project have, and what does the IRR rule say about this investment? Okay, now it's going to turn out for this one that we don't need to do any actual calculations. We're still going to walk through the setup and the calculations just so we can get a feel for what's going on, and so that we know when to identify when we run up against a situation that could have, could potentially have multiple internal rates of return. Right, so the IRR, as we saw in previous examples, is the rate at which net present value equals zero. So what we want to do is map out the timeline for this particular project, and then set up the net present value equation to see what we're dealing with. Right, so we're going to look at it from the perspective of if this person accepts the publishing deal. The cash flows, the expected cash flows, if he accepts the publishing deal, are a cash inflow of $600,000 today. So the publisher is going to give him some, some upfront money to start working on the book. And then he's going to take three years to write the book where he gives up making those speaking engagements or engaging in those, those speaking um, activities. And so he's going to give up $550,000 per year over the next three years. But then the book is going to be published and he expects to get paid $1.1 million the year after the book is published. All right, so what we're looking for here to know if there are multiple internal rates of return or how many internal rates of return there might be is anytime the cash flows flip signs. So for example, we go from a cash inflow today to a cash outflow in year one. We go from a positive to a negative. We know we potentially have one internal rate of return there. And if it was just that one cash flow, we could solve for it pretty easily. It wouldn't be that big a deal. All right, when we go continue down the timeline, we've got a cash outflow end of year one, cash outflow end of year two, cash outflow end of year three. And then we flip signs again. The cash flows change directions, and we have another cash inflow at the end of year four. All right, so we've got two places where the cash flows change directions. And so we have potentially two internal rates of return here. Now, we wouldn't know unless we actually go solve for them, but we can just look at the timeline and say, okay, there are potentially two here because the cash flows change signs twice, and that's all the problem asks for. How many potential IRRs does this project have? Um, and then the follow-up question, what does the IRR rule say about this investment? We're actually going to hold on to that until we walk through what this thing really looks like. All right, now just to get a sense of what would have to happen here, if we wanted to actually solve for the internal rate of return, we'd set up the net present value equation, where we take the present value of the benefits minus the present value of the cost and set that thing equal to zero. So we've got zero as the NPV equals in these first brackets, the present value of the cash inflows. The first one happens at time period zero, so no discounting needed to find the present value. That's already in today's dollars. The second cash inflow happens at the end of year four. It's a $1.1 million cash inflow. So we need to discount that back four periods to get it in today's dollars. But those are our two cash inflows. So inside these first brackets will give us the present value of the benefits. And we subtract from that the present value of the costs, where the costs were three cash outflows of $550,000 at the end of year one, two, and three. So they each need to come back their respective number of periods to get in to time period zero or today's dollars. Right? So if we wanted to solve for the internal rate of return, what we'd have to do is solve for this R that makes this statement true. Now that's a non-trivial exercise. Uh, with algebra, you're not going to do this. What you'd have to do is just look at it and go, gosh, I don't know. Let me try something. I'll plug in 0.1 or, or a rate of return of 10% and just see if it happens to make this statement true. And if it doesn't, you just adjust your guess and go again. Um, which we saw how to do in example 9.3.3 with the financial calculator, and we'll walk through it with this one as well, because I said there are potentially two internal rates of return. 
where your spreadsheet or your financial calculator will not necessarily know that. Um, it's up to you to know that because the cash flows change sign twice, you might have two. What the calculator and the spreadsheet are going to do is it'll just start guessing. And as far as I know, they start at zero and work their way up. So you almost always get the lower internal rate of return first if there are two of them. Except in Excel, you do have the option to make a guess at what you think the internal rate of return is, so you can influence that outcome there. But it's still, as soon as it finds a solution, it's just going to spit it back to you with no information that there might be more than one. So let's plug these cash flows into the calculator and see what we get back here. So I'm going to open up the cash flow worksheet. Of course, the last problem I worked is still in there. So I'm going to hit second and clear work to clear that out. And if you haven't already seen a tutorial on the cash flow worksheet, go back and check out example 9.3.3, where we solve for the NPV and internal rate of return of a multi-year project. Um, and I go kind of step by step explaining what each one is, but I'm going to assume that you've been through those at this point. So I'm going to go kind of quickly here. Cash flow zero is what happens at time period zero on our timeline. In this case, that is a cash inflow of 600,000. So I'll type that in and press enter to store it. <clears throat> Let the down arrow key to go to the next entry. CO1 is the first different cash flow after cash flow zero. On our timeline, that is a cash outflow of 550,000. So I'm going to type that in and make it negative and press enter to store it. And then I'll hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry. FO1 is frequency of that cash flow one, or how many times in a row do you receive that $550,000 cash outflow? In this case, we see it three times. So I'm going to set FO1 to 3, press Enter to store it, and then hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry. CO2 is the next different cash flow. For this problem, that is a cash inflow of 1.1 million. So I'll type that in, press Enter to store it. Hit the down arrow key to check that FO2 is set to its default 1, because we've only seen that cash flow once, and it is. And I like to go ahead and hit the down arrow key three more times just to make sure that the register really did clear out and there's nothing else on there. So on the third press, it should go back to cash flow zero. It does, so I know we're good. Now I want to solve for the internal rate of return, so I'm going to press the IRR key and then press compute. And it's very quickly going to give me a number back, 6.20 or 6.21, depending on how you uh, round that. And sure enough, that is an internal rate of return, but it turns out to only be one of the IRRs. And notice there's no information on the calculator that's flashing up and saying, hey, this is just one of multiple. It finds a solution. It spits it back to you. And you'll find that if you do the same thing with the spreadsheet, you're going to get the exact same answer back unless you enter a guess to go after the higher one first. And here's what's going on. If we were to drop these cash flows into an Excel spreadsheet, and build a net present value profile where we calculate the net present value over a range of discount rates, we're going to find this U-shape to this project where we do indeed have an internal rate of return of 6.2%. And we see that anywhere below 6.2%, this is a positive net present value project, and it's one that we'd want to take on. Anywhere between 6.2 and 35.59, it is a negative net present value project, so we would not take it. And we have another internal rate of return right there at 35.59%, where if our discount rate is above that, it again becomes a positive net present value project. Now, this U-shape comes from the cash inflows being pushed out to the beginning and end of the timeline. So it was a, it was a purposely chosen example to see this. Um, but you wouldn't, unless you actually put these cash flows in the spreadsheet and just calculated a whole range of internal rates of return, you would not necessarily know that there were two of them except that you know the trick. When you draw out the timeline for these cash flows, every time you see the cash flows flip signs or change directions, you now have another potential zero solution there to net present value, which means you have another potential internal rate of return. So in this case, we watch it flip from positive to negative. That's one change. And then from negative to positive, that's the second change. So we know that there are two possible internal rates of returns or two potential internal rates of return. Now, what does the internal rate of return rule say about this particular project? It turns out it says nothing. Remember the net present value or the uh, internal rate of return rule says that we should invest in projects that um, have an, an internal rate of return greater than the cost of capital. Well, in this case, um, imagine that the problem said the cost of capital for this individual was 12%. 
we come up with an internal rate of return of 6.2 percent so that's the expected return on the project the cost of capital is 12 percent so we would reject it we'll suppose though that the cost of capital was five percent all right then the cost of capital is down here below 6.2 percent then the IR rule would say to accept the project which if this were our only internal rate of return that would be fine the trouble is that we've got two of them and we would want to reject the project in between those two and accept it at rates below the lowest figure and above the highest figure just because of the nature of the cash flows and so you would actually have to use two different internal rates of return right rules if you wanted to use this but in general we just say all right internal rate of return doesn't apply here it still gives us useful information but net and present value is really what we want to look at to decide whether or not to accept this project and then we could combine that with the two IRRs just to get a little more information about when the project is attractive and when it is not um, but in general we would just use the NPV rule when we have cash flows that look like this we've got them changing signs over the life of the project or we'd want to be really careful and plug them into a spreadsheet and make sure we really understand the NPV profile of this particular project so that we could gauge the riskiness of accepting it or rejecting it.